my, my mission here is to paint with very broad strokes uh, what cooperation means in translator ethics. And I want to push that. And, and it's, it's old stuff. I did it years ago. I'm going back to it. And I'm, I'm justifying myself as old people tend to do. And my purpose here is to attach that to the concepts that I've been working with more recently, which are risk management and trust. Uh, so that that's the plan. OK, it's to go from the old stuff to the new stuff and join up the dots. A historical account risk. I'll be talking about uh, a way of thinking about translation processes. That is what goes through the brain when they're making decisions. And then trust will be focused on what I think is the big area that we know virtually nothing about, and that's translation reception, the way people, uh, what people do with translations when they're being received and when they're being applied uh, and turned into action in the best of cases. Okay. I'm doing that with respect to the situation I'm in. I'm in, this is week seven of lockdown because of COVID-19 in Melbourne, okay? And, and this is what we're thinking about at the moment. And the communication between government and public is a key element of what's happening around me. And I, I'll be, I will be reflecting on that very directly. Those terms, cooperation, risk, and trust, take on a, a very new residence in this kind of crisis situation. but. I'll tell you from the outset, for me, this is a transitory situation. For me, the uh, need that we have now for behavior change communication with respect to COVID-19 is just a small part. It, it's the first act of the big game that we've got, which is climate change, when we really need sincere, effective, widespread behavior change communication and that, for me, is the big challenge for translation down the track. So when I talk about cooperation, risk, and trust now, I'll be going back to where I got the ideas from and what I do with them. But when I'm looking down the track to the future, it's with respect to those things as, as key instances of behavior change communication, the great challenge we have to face. Cooperation theory. I, I, I didn't sort of wake up, you know, one day and say, oh, cooperation, what a great idea. Um, in fact, I, I, I've been going back to the early stuff I wrote. I forget all the stuff I used to say. And, and uh, there was a book that was published in 1992. And in it, I saw that I, I was unhappy. I was trying to think about ethics, about what should happen and what shouldn't happen. And I wasn't happy with anything, so I got the critique. I have never written about faithfulness or about equivalence as criteria for ethics. Uh, I, I was just reading a review by uh, Xuan Mao, Tian Shan Mao, on, on ethics, and he says, Pim doesn't talk about faithfulness. Everybody else does, so Pim should do it. Well, why don't I do that? Because from the very beginning, I have had a view of meaning as something that is construed in actual use, an act of reading. All texts have to be construed. The text does not have a meaning in it in terms of deconstruction. There is no transcendental signified. If you take that on board seriously, there is nothing in the text that is solid enough to be faithful to or equivalent to. So for my position in the philosophy of language, if you will, from reading Jacques Derrida, certainly in my own trajectory, I have long excluded that kind of thinking about translation. I think they are illusions, they're social fictions, they have their functions, we can analyze that. But if we're doing serious ethics, no, thank you. I'm not going to talk about equivalence or faithfulness. If you want to, you're free to, I don't particularly do that. Nor am I going to talk about scopos, about the, the translator fulfilling the purpose of the text, purpose as a translation of scopos, 
or getting the client's instructions and carrying them out. And you say, well done, you've done well, Ethic, ethical act. Uh, I don't think that is a good solution either. Why? Because purposes are just as much transcendental signifieds as anything in, in the uh, start text ever was. They also have to be construed. And secondly, I don't think an ethics of mercenary behavior is going to satisfy anybody, and certainly not me. I also, in that early book, uh, criticized codes of ethics, what we would call deontological codes, uh, because all they did was say what the translator can't do. It's like restricting, restricting, restricting. It didn't give any affirmative message about what translators should do with their work. And I felt from the very beginning that, that we needed more than limits on what we do. We needed something more positive and affirmative. Um, I also get rid of, I think, uh, the idea that if we do what's expected of us, we'll, we, we are doing fine, or we should do what translators have always done, and then we'll be okay, because people will know what we're doing. Uh, tradition is not reason, and uh, that was an early, early debate, really with Andrew Chesterman, who had a paper uh, call in Target called From Is to Ought. And even Christiana Nort would argue that, that you should do what's expected of you. And if not, just, just tell the reader that you're not doing it. Uh, yeah, that's like my mum saying, you know, go out late at night. As long as I know where you are, just tell me. It doesn't seem to be a satisfying way to approach uh, cross-cultural communication. I needed more than tradition, okay? Uh, and that was in a book that, that was published in 1992. And I didn't talk about cooperation there. I can go back at, at it now and say, I was wandering around the desert. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. But I didn't have the answer that, that I was looking for. Uh, I think if you look at it from that perspective, you might understand why eight years later, um, in a conference in Manchester, I did propose this, that the goal of any translation project should be long-term cooperation between cultures. Which means I'm going to argue that term cooperation as a basis for ethics, rather than any of the other paradigms that were there and that I was less satisfied with. Uh, why? Well, because it seems to give me something affirmative, but it doesn't say uh, in outright terms, you know, use domestication, use foreignizing, uh, say what your client, do what your client says, uh, repeat what the author, you know, all these other precepts that are, are wholly contradictory and don't really give the translator the tools with which to think about a specific situation. My hope here was that a translator that in, in a particular situation with a client and a text and some future users and the text comes from somewhere and it's going somewhere, uh, would be able to think about cooperation. My ethics then addresses not everything we do. It's trying to talk to the translating mind when it has to make a selection. You know, I think that the translation process is for each source text or start text, I don't care which, ST, we quickly generate alternative ways of translating it, that's a generative part of it. And then we select one from there very quickly and with confidence. And I say ethical confidence as well. That selection process is the hard part. Why? Because there are no rules for selecting each one. Note, there's more than two. It's not a binary operation. The mental process has never been binary. We do some really crummy theory in translation studies. Uh, and if there is a rule for selecting one TT from all of that series, then it belongs either to terminology, which is where they have rules, or grammar, which is where they have rules. But in translation, I don't think there are any rules. You have to think about it. It requires the active intervention of theorization in the translation process. If there are rules, it's because there's an authority and there's a power structure. 
and we negotiate with those or respect them, uh, if you will. But if it's a pure translation problem, there are no rules. We have to think. I'll give you some examples in a minute. Now, in a, a book that I did on the translation of uh, on the ethics of translation, translator ethics, uh, I tried to say that making that decision cannot be done in any way without more information. And that information comes back to a prior moment. <clears throat> it's when we choose to undertake a task. And we have to answer the question, why translate? Why should I translate this text? And if you can answer that question, why, <clears throat> in some way, then you can make that decision in some reasonable way. So it's addressing that mind, hoping to give guidance, but also suggesting that the translator should think back as to why this translation is being undertaken. It's not just a Scopos thing, at least in the sense of Scopos um, complying with the, with the client's instructions. This is the translator thinking about the entire situation for themselves to make decisions that are translation decisions. Now, cooperation isn't just an empty term. It's not just being nice with each other, all right? Cooperation does have a technical term uh, and a technical meaning. In a cooperative relationship, both parties win, okay? It's a win-win situation. Both parties are all three parties, all right? Uh, and I'm looking for some kind of situation where all the participants, including the translator, get more out of it than they would if they didn't have the situation. That's a cooperative relationship, okay? It's a, not a zero-sum game. A zero-sum game is if I win, you lose. We're in competition. Cooperation says, no, there are things we can do. One of them is communication. Um, well, communication is a very reasonable communication. Uh, there are things we can do together uh, which are done uh, for the mutual benefits of both, okay? Or all. Uh, that is the guts of that book on, the, on translator ethics. Uh, so it was a long way from the earlier stuff. I'm starting to get an idea of how we can answer some of the queries I had beforehand. Is it a good answer? Oh, I don't know. It hasn't. Uh, it hasn't done spectacularly well in uh, in translation studies. But for me, it's still something I keep there, and it does orient my own choices. To situate where we are, though, uh, there's the law of the land. Okay, and you respect the law. Within that. We have professions, and you respect professional conduct, and within that, you have the translation profession, and that's where we find the codes of ethics. So this is actually a schema I use when I'm teaching the code of ethics of in Australia, which we have to teach. It's a deontological code, a code of ethics. Here, though, I'm talking about ethics uh, as being uh, as something that's done in translation as cross-cultural communication. And these days, I would tend to situate us within the law. I'm not going to tell anyone to break the law, but I would just skip over that profession bit. To tell the truth, I've become less and less interested in the profession of translators and interpreters. In the 1990s, at the beginning of the 1990s, I was very interested. I saw translation studies as helping to build up a solid, recognized profession. These days, I'm far more interested in the social use of translation beyond those professional restrictions. The cooperative principle still never, nevertheless applies. So where did cooperation come from? It I, didn't come to me in a dream. Uh, you can find it all around you. If you're doing pragmatics, it's in Grice. Grice says, if you're having a conversation, you're using the cooperative principle. That is, that your purposes are going to converge. He doesn't say much more about it, but it's certainly there. In translation studies, Holtz-Mentory had a principle of cooperation way back when she says that translation is when an expert in cross-cultural communication 
cooperates with an expert in the field, as she saw translation itself as an act of cooperation. I found it in neoclassical economics, most convincingly, when you have an entire mathematics of win-win transactions, uh, going back to, you know, multiple players and, and uh, you know, the film A Beautiful Mind, uh, the Nash Equilibrium, you know, that the, 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 there are rational ways in which uh, different players, rational egoists can come together for uh, mm -hmm. benefits to be obtained by everybody. And this was part of neoclassical economics, which was certainly not the kind of politics that I was ever involved in. But I saw it there and said, you know what? This, this, is, this is interesting. This is intriguing. There is an alternative to competition. Uh, and I look around us and we see that everywhere there are alternatives to competition. At the time that happened, I was, you know, what, how does interdisciplinary uh, exchange, how do, how do those exchanges happen? I was a doctoral student sharing an apartment with, with a student of economics and the other student was doing negotiation theory. Okay, and we talked about things all night, eating pizza and watching MTV and getting drunk and things like that. But that, that's where I got my economics from. That's how it happens. Interdisciplinarity is no great secret. One of the important books at the time uh, was by Kiohan, uh called After Hegemony. And he was proposing that, well, in, in uh, international relations, this was the end of the Cold War, he was proposing that a regime of cooperation uh, could replace the regimes of hegemony that marked out the Cold War. And I was fascinated by that argument in international relations as well. Sociology has since then, since the 1990s, uh, developed a whole realm of cooperation study where societies are, are measured in terms of high cooperation societies, low cooperation societies. But you can find it in everyday life. In the morning when my wife comes out here and grunts something at me and I grunt something back like it's going to rain today or what are you doing or where, uh, what are we saying to each other? We say, oh, yet another day that it's better to spend together than apart. All my students who are by themselves in apartments in Melbourne at the moment, you understand the value of social interaction. It's better to do it together than apart. And when we undertake that, we enter into communication, and the communication is there so that we get the benefits of combined actions. You can tell why I did sociology and not psychology, for example. Okay. That's cooperation. It comes from all over the place. And it's a very simple idea. Uh, there's cooperation. You win, I win, everybody wins. How can that happen? Here's an ethical problem that's very hard to solve. Uh, this is in Helsinki in 2018. You know that man there, Donald Trump? Uh, he had a meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin in private. And he had his interpreter there for uh, Russian, and she is Marina Gross. And she took notes. You can probably see the notes down there. And afterwards, a U.S. congressional committee called on her to tell them what was in her notes. What did Trump and Putin discuss together? And there's a real question. Should she tell them? Should she reveal what happened between the two leaders? Hmm. Now, IEC, which is the International Association of Conference Interpreters, very quickly came out and pointed uh, out that in the Code of Ethics, confidentiality is one of the principles <coughs> of the profession. So for IEC, no, she should not say what happened. For cooperation theory, though, we really have to think about it. Why would world leaders meet? What kind of cooperation is going to come out of them meeting in private with interpreters? And we don't know because we don't know the content. It's quite difficult to judge. But we can talk about this institution of world leaders meeting 
and chatting informally, spoken communication as being a very good thing for international relations. Why? It builds up relations of trust. They get to know each other and that makes future cooperation more feasible in general. So I think uh, looking at this problem from the perspective of cooperation, we can also answer no, she should not reveal what was done because this institution of private spoken communication is valuable in itself for cooperation and therefore should be presented. So I agree with the outcome in the code of ethics, but I have slightly different reasons for it. And I really think that uh, the profession of interpreting, uh, focusing on the virtues of spoken communication should consider seriously how those virtues favor cooperation in ways that others don't. That is the virtues of the spoken as opposed to the written. I'll move on to another difficult case. These are really hardcore ethical problems that are hard to solve. This one's from Kayoko Takeda, who many of you know. Her next book in 2021 will be called Interpreters and War Crime. And uh, Kayoko, I've actually taken the citation from her presentation at the EST Congress last year. Uh, she knows that more than 100 interpreters were convicted as war criminals. Uh, interpreters working for the Japanese in the Second World War. And they're charged with being concerned in the ill treatment of prisoners of war and local citizens in Japanese occupied territories. The question is, were they unethical? And this is difficult because torture happened, let's say. Uh, the torture was not done by the interpreter but the interpreters were there and the people who suffered the interpreters heard the voice of the interpreter. And so this is the involved in. To what extent are you guilty? To what extent is your work unethical there? Difficult question. Certainly uh, for the tribunals that were held, uh, they were indeed unethical and guilty. Uh, those that work for the Japanese. Uh, they weren't going to do the same thing for the interpreters that work for the British. And you have there a photo of an interpreter working for the United States. And we have in recent years torture carried out by the United States with the help of, it, of interpreters. And this issue does apply to them. What about from cooperation? From the perspective of cooperation, I can say, I think, that yes, their work is unethical because there's no way I can think about that kind of interpreting activity having a cooperative outcome. This guy doesn't look like he's going to get much benefit out of the interaction. So unless some very smart lawyer can come along and argue that out of a torture, there is a mutually beneficial outcome, I feel quite happy in condemning the work of the interpreters as being unethical, I won't say illegal, but unethical for my ethics, to the extent that they could have refused the task. And that is something that has to be decided on each case. That is, go back to the, the basic question, why, why translate? Uh, if you can figure that one out, then you go ahead and do it. But if they couldn't see in that answer to why any possible mutual benefit, don't do it unethical. Uh, I look forward to your comments afterwards. Okay. I should point out, uh, I think Meshonik criticized me for, for working too much on these uh, extreme cases. Uh, I think it's in the extreme cases that we get to test our principles and really see which ones can prevail over others. But they do have consequences for the more mundane practices that we all engage in. I'll have some very mundane examples coming up afterwards. So those are two examples of, of applying a, a, an ethics of cooperation. I must point out that cooperation is not uh, an idea where we have equality. 
In order to get mutual benefits, you do not require equality. As long as one party wins something and the other party wins something, even if their starting position is very different, it's ethically valid. Okay? It's a very minimalist ethic in that sense. Cooperation does not assume neutrality. Uh, the interpreter is not there as an honest broker, like a marriage counselor or something like that. No, the interpreter is there as a player, and the benefits should also be for the interpreter. The profession has its own criteria, its own well-being. Cooperation doesn't mean that you work hard or that there is the perfect translation. Uh, years ago, I did a paper on transaction costs, which actually argues that if you have cheap translation, you're going to get more communication and more cooperation. So in a society, cheap translations may actually be socially beneficial. Little did I know back then in the, in the early 1990s that we'd be living in an age of free online machine translation where less than 1% of the words translated in the world are done by professionals. That 99 point whatever percent is done by people using free online machine translation. I think this is a laudable fact. I think it should do a lot for cooperation between cultures because even when there are mistakes and know that they take the risks they get more out of it than they put into it cooperation nowhere does cooperation assume any access to truth i got rid of truth long ago when i got rid of that transcendental signified in the in the economic theory they assume that the subject that is the person is a rational egoist and they're going to lie to suit their own advantage. You know, lying is built into the system. This is Donald Trump's theory, man. But, but in the interaction, you must, the other party must advance, okay? Uh, so the principle there, you can lie and get away with it. Translation is a lie in many cases, it's assuming to present what's actually said in the other text. But you must ensure the well-being of the other. I'm, I'm opposing a views of translation which are based on competition position. Uh, this is Gisele, Gisele Sapiro, okay? Uh, she works in uh, Paris and uh, she works on the sociology of translation. Uh, she writes an article of translation. Uh, the idea here is that um, Translation is, is a competition marketplace where if one advances, the other will lose. These ideas come straight from the sociology of Pierre, Bour Pierre Bourdieu. Yeah, Bourdieu had, had, had all these social capitals. Cooperation was not one of them. Social life for Bourdieu was competition and the accumulation of capitals. No cooperation, no happiness as being a value in, in Bourdieu. And th this is how we get these sociologies that see translation as competition, as the occupying of space. And this is how we get these intellectuals who have their favorite cause to advance and will come out with things like this. If you're not with me, you're against me. I've got this a couple of times, you know, Italian intellectuals, especially, I don't know why. You know? This is the battle and you've got to be on my battle. And if you're not with me, you're against me. Dividing the world into two camps and presuming to position me in such a way as I'm one side or the other. Uh, these, these binarisms are incredibly pernicious, um, incredibly domineering, and, and, and very presumptuous, assuming to have some cause or dichotomy that can locate every other person in function of what's important for you. Uh, the idea of cooperation goes straight against that. Okay, it says, that it is possible to have mutual benefits. There are other reasons for studying translation. One is it brings diversity and difference. Going back to Berman and many others could say that as well. Yeah, that's fine. That motivated me for a long time to the extent that, that when I first published, I didn't do it in English. I wanted to do it in other languages and I did in other languages. These days, though, we can, we can see that the ethics of diversity and difference 
produces these echo chambers that we get in social media of like talking with like, of nothing happening across and between social and cultural groups. So I think for me, that cause has not served well and is not uh, coherent with the virtues of cooperation. Translation is a way of developing the receiving culture. We've had that as an argument since Schleiermacher. I'm fine with that as a reason for working on translation, as long as the development is cooperative, as long as there are benefits for all concerned. But um, for me, the, the reason for working on translation has primarily not been any of those three for a long time, and that's for decades now. It's been because translation enhances communication across cultures, and that can enhance cooperation. Cooperation is not an activism, okay? Uh, it's not enough to advance a cause that serves just one side. And the reason for that is that we're operating on cross-cultural communication where there are going to be very deep differences about what is acceptable and laudable. And we have to live with those differences and accept them. It's part of the nature of our task. For the same reason, it's not an ethics of content, of some kinds of messages being worth transmitting and others not. I know there are some people out there who, who are, want to draw up an ethics of, of, of translation, which says we will not translate anything that has a violence or hate speech or is uh, gender discriminatory or, and this whole list of, of bad, bad, bad things. The trouble with that is that each culture has a different list of bad things. And our job is to facilitate communication between cultures. So our ethics cannot be based on a list of bad things. At the end of the day, you have to speak with your enemy. You have to speak with your enemy. And if you have an ethics that, that says, I'm not going to, to transmit these messages, I'm going to operate as a censor, uh, then you are assuming not only more knowledge than the translator has, more power than we really have, uh, you're also curtailing the possibility of cooperation. This is where it gets very tricky. And this is where I'm willing to discuss for as long as you like. Uh, the translator is not responsible for the content of what is translated. There's an author for that, or there's a client for that. We're not responsible for content, but we should be able to make decisions on the basis of the consequences, on the basis of whether or not there's going to be cooperation. Uh, and if we can project that and see, yes, there's a possibility for cooperation here, then our translation decisions should go in that sense. I've done this. You know, to make it, should we work for bad people? I'm going to confess. I worked for a bad person. Here he is. He was president of Catalonia for many years when I was translating. I translated for him. I did speeches for him. There he is. He was corrupt. He's going to prison with his wife for embezzlement and having a bank account in Andorra, not paying taxes and all that stuff. Okay. I worked for a bad person. Ah, am I therefore guilty? Well, I didn't work to get him voted. I would never have voted for him. But I did believe and I do believe in the values of minor cultures. I think cultural diversity is a very important thing. I think that my translations enable greater awareness of Catalan culture and, and cultural diversity, which was good for Catalonia and good for the Europe that I was translating for. For my ethics, I'm very, very happy with what I was doing. Was I working for a bad man? Yes. Did I know he was bad? Mm, we sort of knew. But I was totally on board with that side of his politics. And I would not want like to be accused of... Uh, having received any of the embezzled funds, I assure you I didn't. I'll give you another example. I said I was going to the banal, but these are real examples from, from my professional work. Uh, by the way, don't believe that there are you know, academics and practitioners or theorists and practice. No, no, I've, I've been doing translations for, I don't know, 30 years. 
And I made more money out of translating than I did out of being an academic, believe me. Anyway, here's one. that you know, I've, I've used this example before, uh, so forgive me for the repetition. Uh, the Spanish there translates quite literally as the white man has led the pace of human progress for the last 2,000 years. What a horrible sentence. And uh, I didn't translate it, but I was actually in charge of the translation of an encyclopedia from Spanish into English and then marketed out into other languages uh, because of the illustrations. It's a children's, oh, a children's encyclopedia. This went up in a children's encyclopedia and we didn't pick it up. And we didn't, it, it went out to the marketing. Um, the translation finished up actually in Taiwan. It finished up in many different places, but uh, they were therefore interested in buying the illustrations and replacing the text. But they objected to this and similar traits of unacceptable ideology. And uh, they said, yes, uh, change it. And they came back. I said, I'm sorry. Yes, that should not be there. I will change that. And I just got rid of that and about 12 other bits of Spanish fascist ideology. Then, however, the author got wind of this and wrote to the people in Taiwan uh, complaining about what was being done. And the people in Taiwan wrote back and said, well, it's not true because uh, China uh, led the world in, you know, uh, spaghetti, you know, yeah, you know, whatever, pasta and, and uh, printing and uh, fireworks, the gunpowder and, and lots of other things. So I did this letter. And then the author in Spain, I'm sorry this is a long story, but it's a true one. The author in, St in Spain wrote back to them and saying, I don't care about that. Nothing compares with the beauty of Gothic cathedrals. And I got this text in Spanish to translate into English. I was doing the, the exchange. That's the first time in my life I said, there's no reason to translate. These two people are never going to cooperate with each other, especially the Spanish go over here. I'm not going to translate this. It serves no purpose. Please, I have more important things to do. Get rid of this unacceptable language because it's non-cooperative. You never get to sell the encyclopedia to Taiwan with that sort of language in it anyway, and I will not translate this. Okay? So uh, a cooperate, an ethics of cooperation can tell you when to refuse, and I probably should have refused it even before getting that far, when to refuse to translate. Let me move on now to the world we live in. Those are from the past, the 1980s and 1990s. I think in the world of uh, COVID-19 and climate change, which I said is the big mission, uh, we have to communicate in order for people to change their behavior. And cooperation is what we're seeking. We have to get across to people that, that they change their behavior. If everybody does it. It's for the good of all. It is a win-win situation. In this world, cooperation is not just a guideline thing. Cooperation has to be what the communication will achieve. If behaviors change, then there are benefits for all. I'm at the point now with this particular context where cooperation is not just the ethics, it's what we have to get at, what we have to go towards. This brings me to risk. Once you get the idea of cooperation, risk management is easy because cooperation says successful communication is this. Uh, I've got win-win situation that defines success. Once I know what success is, I can start calculating the probabilities of failure. That is, in this case, the probability of non-cooperation. And then I can start to uh, assess the risks of those, of those probabilities as risks and there are different ways of dealing with them. Believe me, it, it, it helps. Uh, I'll just point out the, the theory of, of risk management that then as it relates to cooperation. When you've got a risk, and I'll give you an example in a minute, uh, you can avoid it, risk aversion, okay? You can transfer it, pass it on to someone else. Uh, 
I'm putting what's in the dictionary. I put in what my client said. I put in something that's close to the ST. I transferred the risk to someone else. Or I can take a risk in the hope that there will be other benefits, other kinds of benefits coming on. And uh, something we call risk mitigation, but I think a better term for it is risk trade-offs. We counter one risk with a lesser risk, okay? I'm not going to go into those different kinds of, of, of risk management in great detail, but I will point out that uh, on all the research that I've done, the one very clear suggestion is that translators are mostly risk averse. Risk averse and risk transferring. Translators don't want to take risks, which is why translations tend to be boring. You can see this, for example, in all of what uh, Gilles Levy called the, the tendencies of translation. Those tendencies were then misnamed universals. Different ways in which translational language differs from non-translational language. On all accounts, it plays it safe, avoids risk, becomes more boring. Okay, fewer, uh, it's, it's less, le less uh, lexical richness, for example. Not time to go into that now, but anyway. And when in doubt, translators will therefore avoid the risk, you know, do something simple, leave it out or dumb it down, or use risk transfer, as I said. They'll uh, get it from the dictionary, get it from what somebody's, what the client says, or get it from the ST. Uh, that means that in, in current translation activity, of the kind I see around, and we've been looking at the COVID communication in Melbourne, there is very little risk-taking, very few trade-offs. And this results in some translations that are very hard to read. And people don't understand them, and they don't apply them, and we get non-cooperation. That is, we have communities that do not believe the, the information that's sent to them, that don't wear masks, that are out protesting against COVID, and they're gonna be there every Saturday. Next Saturday, they'll be there again. Uh, and it's because they don't understand or want to understand or trust, I'm coming to in a minute, communication like this. Now, okay, that's a big block of language, and that's supposed to be informing people about what they're allowed to do in Melbourne. Now, what I did with that was with my class, I got them to do TAPS, Think Aloud Protocols. You can do that in Word with the Dictate tool. Uh, and every student can record themselves, what they're saying about it. And what you've got in uh, yellow is the bit that's the translation, and the non-yellow is the person negotiating the doubts. <clears throat> and you can see down there that there are lots and lots of problems with this very long sentence, which has a big problem here. If you look back at the text, it's got lawful excuses. <clears throat> no idea what to do with lawful excuses. Doesn't seem to come over into Chinese very well at all. <clears throat> and these are the points that were problematic in the text. Now, the translators uh, knew these were problematic. <clears throat> they did what they could. But um, in the end, translated very, very close to the text. <coughs> All of them chose risk transfer. Uh, none of them took um, it upon themselves to, for example, break down the long sentence into shorter sentences. This is what I would have done with it. Uh, this is one long sentence about lawful excuses, okay? The translators had trouble understanding it, they had trouble reformulating it, and when in doubt, they went back to what was in the ST. The problem is that the ST was badly written, I think, and I would rewrite it like this. Sometimes you do not have to cover your mouth and nose. Uh, we don't talk about masks here, we have face covering, but many languages don't have a good word for that. Don't bother about the word, spell it out and make it very, very, very clear. The same thing for doing strenuous exercise. What does that mean? Well, I know from other parts in the, in the text that it means when you're running or you're riding a bicycle. So I don't know if you can see this image up here. We've got soldiers on the streets in Melbourne with masks and attractive women running past with no masks. 
That's uh, illegal according to this text because she has a lawful excuse and they don't. Go figure. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking for cooperation, but I'm looking for behavior change in the interest of cooperation. And this involves probably doing more than certainly my students want to do with the text. Taking risks, taking risks, significant rewriting, uh, making things much clearer, spelling things out, using radical explicitation in this case. In times of the pandemic that we have, it becomes interesting to consider propositions like the following. The most successful society, I mean, there are many such propositions around. The, the, the liberal one is, uh, economically liberal one, is the most successful society is the one that allows the most freedom, perhaps, if you like. One that generates the most wealth, perhaps, if you like. That, that has the least wealth um, disequilibrium in the distribution of wealth, if you like. But here is a, a proposal. The most successful society is the one that best communicates the findings of science to the greatest number of people. That is, they can get information, believe it, and use it to reduce the risks of non-cooperation. The problem is that the general populace, includes me, simply does not understand what science is doing this, these days. Understanding is not going to cut it. Understanding is, is not the solution. The solution is going to have to be something else. This is Latour. Uh, this is going back to what in French is La Sociologie de la Traduction, translation sociology. These guys, this actor network theory, they were looking at how science is communicated to societies historically. And they've got lots of studies from that. And they call that process translation, but it's much more than translation. It's about how information is construed and passed from one social group to the next. Latour 2018, though, is talking about this, and he's talking about climate change. He's not talking about COVID, he's talking about climate change. And he, he says that, 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 that facts can only be transmitted and remain robust in a society when they're supported by a common culture, institutions that can be trusted. And that's the one I want to uh, insist on here. Okay. Decent public life and reliable media, those are also very necessary things. Translation is part of that when we live in multicultural and multilingual cities. Melbourne has 250 languages, a bit little more, spoken at home. It is incredibly multilingual and multicultural. And getting that information into all those languages and all those households is a massive feat. It's only partly involving translation. If the mediator is not trusted, that is the translator or whoever else is conveying it, no ethical decision can prevail. Why do you trust people? Because it's too hard to do it yourself, okay? Uh, I want, to, when I talk about trust, I'm, I'm not, I'm in the last section now. When I talk about trust, I'm not talking about trusting your brother because you know your brother very well, okay? Uh, for the sociologist, Niklas Luhmann, uh, that is predictability. Predictability is quite different from trust. Trust is when you don't understand what's happening there and you have to trust this person because they have a better chance of understanding. Uh, uh, you trust a lawyer, for example, because the law is complex and they can simplify and, and indicate how you should act in relation to it. Trust reduces complexity, but in doing so increases risk because the person you trust may always betray you. Translators are very much in that position because the person who trusts us doesn't have access to the language on the other side that we know about. They have no way of checking on us really, or very few ways of checking on us. And if we lose trust, we lose the value of trustworthiness, we lose our entire function and cooperation becomes impossible. That's why when we 
translate or communicate, as I do with that text, the COVID text, I have to gain trust from people to let them do that. To I have to gain trust from my client over there to let me cut the sentence and explain things in different ways. And I have to hope that when I do that, I'm gaining the trust of the other community who can understand and apply that and turn it into cooperative action. Trust then for me is not a condition for cooperation. It's not like only work with people you know well and, and you can predict who are on your side. You know, there's the goodies over here, only work with the good guys, don't work with the bad guys. No, we have to work with the bad guys, I think. Trust is not a condition for cooperation. It's part of it. In the very act of cooperation, we are trusting that the other will act cooperatively with us. Okay. Uh, which means there's always some degree of risk involved. That's how those three concepts fit together. Cooperation, risk, and trust. Of the three, the most fascinating for me these days is undoubtedly trust. Is the way that people receive translations and choose to trust them or not trust them. Uh, around Melbourne at the moment, many people are not trusting translations. I want to close now with a, a true story, a very recent story this time. I think about a month ago, I put this article out and I was, uh, we did this in class. My class went through and uh, we found mistakes in the uh, translations of COVID-related material, but there were fairly minor mistakes, mistakes like the ones I pointed out. How do you, you know, what's the term for face covering? Is it a mask? What kind of stuff is it like that? And um, when I was putting this together with the help of journalists, uh, we, we discussed, do we put the mistakes up the front to attract people's attention? And I thought, well, no, if I do that, it will make them not trust translations and, and therefore move away from translations and, and we will lose cooperation. So I wanted to put trust up the top as being the most important thing. And then the mistakes come down later on in the text. And I was really saying that the translators in Australia work very well, but they have to do more different things in order to gain and maintain trust. That is, they have to do more than translate, in fact. What intrigued me is that um, a little after that, there was a, a, a piece of news on uh, translations in the COVID uh, context with this image. And this image here is the most repeated image about translations, I think, in the Australian media ever. Uh, it's, it's about... Uh, a, a, a guideline about how to wear a mask, and uh, the Arabic is uh, the Arab. Well, one of them, this the Arabic is mixed up with Farsi. You know, they just mixed up two languages because they use the same similar script. Big, big balls up, uh, big mistake, and that's repeated, 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 repeated everywhere on the television, in the press, in Twitter, all over the place. And so I've been getting journalists coming back to me. I had one today, this afternoon, saying, hey, what's happening to translation in Australia? Why do we do it so badly? And as much as I tell them that, look, this is one case. It's not a translation error. It's a workflow error. They didn't check it before releasing it. Obviously, it's something you, you fix up. And that, in general, the translations are okay, there are minor things and they could be a lot clearer, but this is an exceptional thing. As much as I tell them that, the journalists are not interested. The journalists want scandal. And so my words are, are twisted around, so I'm really saying quite the opposite from what I, I, I intended to say. I'm trying to get out a message that the translations should be trusted and that the profession is very trustworthy here, which I believe it is. It's incredibly controlled by, by an accreditation authority, which is the most bureaucratic in the world. Uh, but the, the role of journalism was to erode trust. And so I had this ethical problem in my dealings with the press here. And there's an ethics that concerns cooperation. Now, what's intriguing for me is that 
I had limited success with my little piece about trust. You know, that's pretty boring for the press. But these people with that image had great success. It went everywhere. It got the politicians alarmed and the Premier of Victoria, which is where I am, threw $14.3 million for mediation and fixed it. I mean, fixed it, <clears throat> did something to improve it. The press was better than I was. I'm recognising my limitations here as a, as a dumb academic who tries to be very careful and, and look for cooperation. <clears throat> a bit of scandal can work. However, and this is where I want to get to, <clears throat> that money was not spent on translations, <clears throat> on printed material or on websites. Because <clears throat> the people at risk are the elderly and they don't go on the internet to look up printed material. The printed material never gets them anyway. They got people going around door from door who speak the languages of the community. So if you're in the Chinese part of Melbourne, parts of Melbourne, they speak Chinese, and you're out with the Afghan community, they're speaking Dashtu, okay, and whatever. And that, that is how you get behavior change. When you've got a physical person there using spoken language to explain things to people, and that you can do it in a, in a way that's dialogic, and you can handle doubts, and you can convince them that it's trustworthy. I've got to the point now in my work with this particular problem that I see the limitations of translation studies. Everything we've been doing or I've been doing in translation studies has been based on this, of an ST and a TT and the best way to get those two to, to match each other in some way. These days, I see very clearly that what's really important is where that ST is coming from and everything that preceded it. And we should be looking back at that so that we can change it, rewrite the source, if you will. And that even more important, we have to know where that text go, goes, what it's intended to do and how it can do it better. I think the translation studies in its adhesion to professionalism, to a translation profession, has cut off its vision at the source and cut off its vision after the text has been produced. These days I prefer to talk about mediation, about behavior change, and I want us to look both that way and that way, and indeed at ourselves, in order to enhance cooperation. <clears throat>